In favor of time, it now, we could now um, introduce uh, the lecture by uh, different topics, so more technical topic, uh, if you want. Uh, the lecture uh, from uh, Castellón in Spain by Angel Del Pobil on the visual neuroscience uh, of uh, manipulation and grasping. Angel, if you are there. So, as you can see, this talk is going to be based on my recent uh, book. In fact, uh, according to the publisher, its uh, publication date is 2016, but uh, it's physically available. I, have a, I brought a copy there. So, uh, when I was preparing this talk, I, I had a feeling that uh, trying to even summarize the main ideas of the book was kind of a mission impossible. In fact, I change a little bit the, the subtitle. The original subtitle is Achieving Sensory Motor Skills Through Dorsal Ventral Stream Integration, which refers to the main uh, novelty or scientific contribution. Instead, I <clears throat> replace this subtitle by something simpler like Ideas for Functional Computational Models. So the purpose of my talk is to sell, uh, I mean, uh, to present uh, the main uh, ideas in, in this book. Before starting, I would like to stress the fact that the first author of the book uh, is Eris Lacho, so it's a joint work with him, and in fact, he's the primary uh, author of, of this research. Uh, okay, so I would like now to introduce you to one of my colleagues, Antonio Morales, who is a professor now. This picture was taken some years ago when he was a student at the University of Massachusetts working with this robot. Later we designed a robot that looks similar. It's our tomatosals, our humanoid torso. So if, you, if I ask you, after so many years of doing research, I've been doing research on grasping and manipulation for the last 20 years, uh, who would perform better in grasping? either Antonio or a robot, I think the answer would be evident for everyone. In fact, you know, after following all the lectures in this uh, series, that uh, humans or animals in general were much better, perform much better than any intelligent system or robot. In general, we can say in a, in a structure of real environments, especially in tasks that, that sub contain interaction with the environment, typically with sensory motor skills involved in the task. This is especially the case for robotic grasping, which any system available nowadays is very far from the versatility, the dependability, the autonomy of uh, human or other primates, monkeys, etc., especially and many other animals. So uh, you must be familiar with these two pictures from uh, Rolf's book. I'm going to show you quite a few slides uh, showing the, the brain, but uh, I'd like to stress from the beginning that uh, we're not interested in cognition as symbol processing, but uh, rather with the picture on the right-hand side. So cognition understood as this emergent uh, result from the sensory motor and interaction processes, in this case uh, about manipulation with typically with the hands. You may say that perhaps uh, Antonio is a professor, so he, he knows a lot, he's an expert in manipulation, but even if we take a, a five-year-old child like this one or even a monkey, it would outperform clearly any <laughs> robotic system. So why is that? <clears throat> well, you know that uh, humans are especially good at uh, manipulation. Uh, Helga Ritter likes to call it manual intelligence. And there is a theory in which when we were able to walk on two legs, then we freed our hands to manipulate tools, and that uh, at the same time developed to trigger the development of our intelligence. So we believe that uh, we endow a robot with this capacity of have some manual intelligence compared to at least monkeys. So we are working in the, in the wrong direction. So what are our research goals today uh, that we can find, of course, all the details in the book? So we try to get inspiration in this case from uh, the neuroscience. There's lots of finding in, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years very relevant to manipulation and grasping. So in a way, this is a, there would be an example as a synthetic methodology. So 
we try to improve the performance of robots by understanding and mimicking the solutions that are available in a vast literature on neuroscience. And at the same time, this could be interesting as a way of uh, testing some neuroscience hypotheses or even proposing new ones by implementing computation models in our, in our robots. So where do we start? <clears throat> uh, you remember, for sure, this uh, <clears throat> picture from uh, Rolls book in which our, this little boy is uh, trying to apply this synthetic methodology by observing uh, the ant with his magnifying glass. Instead, we will use different tools. Uh, the main one used in the neuroscience literature is direct recording uh, single cells or recording directly with microelectrodes introduced in the brain, typically in the brain of some different uh, monkeys, different macaque species typically. And some others that I will come on later. Of course, this is not the case. Uh, the main uh, uh, technology for to be used with humans. Okay, let's start now with a <clears throat> psychophysics experiment or optical illusion that you may be familiar with. So you look at these two group of uh, circles. If I ask you to tell me which of the two circles on the left or on the right that are located in the middle of the group, which one is bigger? So I'm referring to either this circle here or the other here. I think all of you would agree with me that uh, you have the impression that the circle on the left is bigger, has a bigger diameter than the one on the right. But if we draw two parallel lines, you will see that uh, they're exactly the same size. So why is that? There is a second part of the experiment, probably not so well known. It is if we implement this with physical disks and we ask uh, a subject to go and, and grasp it, and we measure, analyze the, the, the position of the fingers, the pre-shaping when we are reaching towards this uh, disk, we will say that the fingers are not full, so are not uh, uh, behaving differently in one case or another. So in a way, we would say that our visual system is fooled by, by this uh, optical illusion, but our fingers are not. <clears throat> Of course, the fingers don't know because they are getting the, the same, uh, they are <clears throat> adjusting according to visual input. So something, something is inconsistent here. So this is just uh, a hint towards uh, the main uh, hypothesis on which our, our work is based. So we need to start a little bit by looking at the, at the brain. There's a lot of terminology that is more or less explained. Uh, sorry um, uh, about that if you're not familiar with the neuroscience terminology. So in the brain, we can distinguish four main areas, the frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, and the occipital at the back. And also well, the cerebellum, which is involved in this kind of, of uh, motions. So if we mm, analyze how visual processing is done in the in the brain, so it starts with some uh, in the, well uh, vision starts at the occipital uh, lobe at the back of, of your brain, and it starts in a region called B1, which is the the primary visual cortex. But after some early stages of some basic processing, it uh, early splits into two so-called pathways. One go up and it's called the dorsal stream, whereas the other one moves, all the processing is done in, in, in regions in the temporal at the back, at the inferior part of the brain, that is called the ventral. So you see that uh, we are calling the dorsal stream the where and how, where, uh, whereas and, and the other one, the ventral, is called the what. So we can advance that uh, in the previous physical experiment, the ventral stream, the what, was giving us the wrong information because it's based on contextual information and it's kind of confused by the other circles. But the dorsal stream, which is more involved in grasping and manipulation, is not related to this kind of contextual information and is based on some local measures that are correct in the two cases. Well, regarding terminology, uh, I will speak quite a lot about today about dorsal and ventral so if you look at uh, 
uh, a tetrapod, a, a, an organism like this lizard, uh, ventral refers to the belly in Latin, and dorsal refers to the back. So the dorsal stream, the warehouse stream, is kind of uh, at the back of the, the superior part of the brain, whereas the ventral is at the belly part at the bottom, at the inferior part of the brain. So to summarize the current uh, knowledge base on uh, hundreds in, in, in the book, at least hundreds of, uh, quite a few hundreds of references on uh, neuroscience to support all of our claims. So based on this, uh, we could say that there is the traditional view, this, this uh, hypothesis is now kind of uh, 20 years old, so it's very well known in, in neuroscience. The, the basic, this, uh, what I'm showing here. So there's kind of two principles traditionally considered as independent, uh, mostly independent uh, visual processing, in which the ventral stream deals with object uh, recognition, so it provides a kind of a global invariant analysis, including information about uh, object features like the weight or the meaning or based on previous experience is based on, uh, on uh, taking the scene as the frame of reference. That uh, explains why the, in, the, in the previous experiment the, uh, the, the other circles were interfering in the process. It's a long-term representation where the dorsal stream is, is a kind of online computation just for action, for the action of grasping. Typically, it's, it's involved in visual motor control the analysis is local, local features, local shape, local size, of, of course, the actual location of the object. So it's a kind of two parallel uh, visual processing with two different, clearly different purposes. So let's just start a little bit. Uh, I have to summarize very much, of course, because uh, I don't have time. Uh, in fact, I need to apologize because I'm showing uh, slides that has that will contain much more information that I comment here. I prefer to leave there so you can use it as a reference. Or of course, the, the real information is in, is in the book. So this whole procession, as I said, starts at the back of our brain in the occipital lobe with uh, early visual precision and the primary visual cortex, V1, regions called V1, V2, V3. But uh, soon after that, it splits into these two uh, pathways. So the dorsal stream goes into a region called V3A, and then we will have uh, one called CIP and another one called uh, AIP. So uh, the names are kind of confusing for, for engineers because most of the names do not refer to their function. They refer to the anatomy. So CIP or AIP refers to ant anterior intraparietal sulcus that uh, refers to the uh, anatomy, to the, the, the particular uh, region. So I will use just the, the acronyms, but the important thing I would like to stress is the, the function. But of course, in neuroscience, they need to record, so it's very important where it is located and, uh, in the brain. So I will skip the description of the early processing, and now I'm going to focus on AIP, and then I will mention some uh, uh, ideas about CIP too. So what happens in AIP? AIP is well known as an, an an area in this uh, parietal cortex that, uh, when in the experiments, when they measure the, the the response of the neurons. Well, here incidentally, I would like you to introduce to my co-author Eris Kinlato. Here, can you see him? That's actually his brain. In uh, when he was uh, working at the laboratory in, uh, in the University of Western Ontario. So that's Eris' brain, and uh, what you see here. Is based on uh, fMRI experiments of so functional magnetic resonance imaging. That is, of course, the, the technique, one of the techniques that is used with humans. So this particular area of the brain activates when the, the subject is grasping an object, especially if vision is involved. Remember that this is a basically a visual area. But also when the subject is looking at an object with the intention of grasping. So let's analyze a little bit more. So it's receiving information from CIP, but kind of local information regarding features that are relevant for grasping. And the, the, the explanation now that is proposed by the new scientist is that uh, there are neurons that describe uh, a representation, they contain a, a representation based on, on shape and also representations regarding the hand configuration. And in a way, this AIP is 
uh, linking, so is performing some kind of uh, visual motor coordination by linking the, sh the shape of representation with this high representation, it's integrating. In a way, it's generating and is selecting the grasp configuration that are most suitable for the particular uh, object by uh, using the visual information about local features provided by the previous uh, uh, region CIP. So what happens after AIP? Of course, you need to project to more uh, motor-oriented uh, areas. So we'll move to an area called PMV or ventral premotor cortex, in which this uh, we will see this final grasping is composed. But, and also, well, this surveillance. Well, there are a lot of uh, details and areas that are not. I don't have to comment. So if we go back to our picture of the brain, we have this. Uh, dorsal stream up to AIP. And then, as I said, there is a separate, principal separate <coughs> uh, stream, which is this um, ventral stream, in which uh, the data flow, the information flows along the, the temporal lobe. So we have a first uh, array there called V4 that is starting to process information, visual information, but with a very different purpose. And then the main area here is uh, so-called LOC. So what is LOC going to do? As you can imagine so far, uh, the purpose of LOC, the main purpose is object recognition. So the kind of information it will receive from B4 uh, is, is not kind of local features, but it's more integrated <coughs> highlight visual input about uh, about the shape. So information that is relevant for object recognition, some kind of uh, first uh, categorization of objects, so that uh, LOC can integrate that information and visual elements that share some uh, attributes like orientation, color, or depth. Of course, the representation, uh, as opposed to the, the process in the, in the dorsal stream, is invariant with uh, a 3D view, for instance, or a silhouette. They are recognized, they can be recognized at the same object. This is very different from what happens in the dorsal stream, for instance. Uh, if you change the point of view, the processing can be different because it's not recognized at the same object, because it's analyzing locally the features that are more relevant for the grasping. Okay? So this, in LOC, we have kind of a conceptual representation. Uh, modern or more recent uh, theories or, or proposals uh, are going to link the two streams. So here I anticipate that uh, LOC is uh, very likely involved in reaching and grasping, of, even though traditionally the main role was the dorsal, the dorsal stream. I think you can understand that if you are going to, to grasp a familiar ob object, <clears throat> probably you don't relate so much in, uh, in the online visual information that you're getting, but you need to combine it with your experience. If it's a, f a familiar object, you know how to grasp it, or if it's a tool, or etc. This is also <clears throat> uh, been uh, tested with so-called delayed grasping, in which you rely more on the memory than on the actual visual in input. So uh, let me go to this uh, idea. So Locke may contribute to this grasping with using, contributing with spark experiences or memories, etc. So here we are back at the brain. So uh, more recent findings suggest and that there is, these two streams are not completely independent. So there is some connection between, uh, in this case, B4 and CIP. So part of the information that originally was intended for just of your recognition can be shared with the, with the dorsal stream with the purpose of manipulation action. And the same with LOC and AIP at different levels of the, of the description. Okay. So if we move uh, from where we were before, from AIP, then we enter this uh, frontal part of the brain, so the, the frontal lobe. And there we move into the so-called motor area. So we have this uh, pre-motor ventral or ventral pre-motor Area. What is going on there? This is already a motor area. Uh, the terminology, well, 
incidentally, I would mention that uh, if, if some of you are familiar, you may see that I'm using a, a human brain for this planation, but uh, a lot of the results that I'm presenting are based on studies with monkeys. So at the book, we try to clarify that when we compare a human brain with a um, macaque brain. <clears throat> but what I'm saying here it's, uh, does not contradict uh, the findings. So some terminology may be different or, or the, the functions may be slightly different, but there is uh, uh, at this level a very good correspondence between the, the, two, the two nervous systems, the two brains have at this. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with this, in, in, in monkeys, uh, this, uh, the corresponding area is referred as uh, F5. So this is a very curious thing because uh, neurons, or in this case, uh, by F fMRI studies, this part uh, activates, so this response, when the subject is performing a, a hand action, which is, is something we can expect, it's kind of a motor area, but also when the subject is imagining to be performing this action, and even more when the subject is seeing somebody doing this action, this grasping action. Or, so this is related to mirror neurons that I'm sure that you're familiar or you have heard of them at least, but I'm not uh, elaborating on that anymore here. So the role of this uh, F5 or premotor action is to compose the actual motor action. So the theory is that it contains a vocabulary of motor actions and based on the so to speak, proposal of a grasp configuration provided by the visual, uh, visual processing at AIP. So it would select the actions and combine them <clears throat> according to this shape, size, etc. that fits better for the particular grasping action. What happens next? Of course, then you need to execute the action. To execute the action, you need to move to, uh, sorry, to these primary motor areas called M1, and this is the, the following step, which is actually sending the signals, it's involving sending the signals to the muscles and actually perform the, the action. There, are, uh, this is uh, still a simplification, even, even though it may look complex because there are many other areas involved. I didn't speak about what happens with tactile sensing, so this is the so matrosensory cortex is one, uh, or the prefrontal cortex, which uh, relates to the intention. So if the in my intention for grasping an object is to use it as a tool or to pour water from water or whatever, so it, it may modulate or influence the, uh, the way I grasp the object. So of course there is prefrontal cortex involved. And then we have, uh, some other parts of the brain, of course, the cerebellum uh, is playing a, a key role in the in the forward models for the actual execution of the task, or the basal ganglia, or so. There's quite a few areas that are more or less explained in the in the book. So, let's conclude this part by uh, stressing the evidence for this uh, two stream hypothesis that is, I think, is well established in the neuroscience community. So the first idea was based on uh, two uh, neurological impairments. One is called optic ataxia and the other visual agnosia. That refers to with something, uh, some lesion is making that one of the two streams is not working properly. In the case of the optic ataxia, you'll see this patient is perfectly recognizing the object as a spoon, but is unable to properly uh, pre-shape the fingers uh, when reaching to a, a, <clears throat> a good grasp. So its ventral system is not working, but it can recognize the object. Conversely, a patient with visual agnosia would be unable to recognize the object, but it doesn't have any problem to manipulate it. And, and even in this case, this patient is trying to recognize the object by uh, tactile, tactile uh, exploring the object with a touch because it's an, she's absolutely unable to recognize the object even though she has no problem in reaching and grasping it. We have already mentioned that uh, there are hundreds of studies based on uh, single cell experiments recording uh, the, the response of neurons in, in, the, in primate brains psychophysical students like the optical illusion that I mentioned, and uh, more recently, uh, 
in the case of humans, brain imaging experiments, when fMRI or PET or TMS, etc. So, this is kind of the introduction, and I'm running out of time, I guess, uh, but I think if I don't introduce it. So I, I would like to stress some of the main ideas, and I will refer you to the, to the book, too, of course. Uh, so what do we want to do? <clears throat> so uh, we have seen that uh, these two uh, streams perform this kind of complementary task, and there is uh, more and more evidence regarding this collaboration. So though of the ventral stream is intervening also in grasping action. So we want to develop, a, first step is to develop a model, as following this kind of uh, synthetic methodology, a model based on, on the function of the different uh, parts of the brain, areas of the brain that are more important for vision-based grasping. So uh, even though I'm not stressing this too much, as I said, the main contribution is that we will pay special attention to the uh, interaction between the, the two streams, which is kind of a, a, a more recent uh, results or um, hypothesis uh, in the neuroscience community. And we'll try to be faithful to the biological reality, but at the same time, we want it to be a working robotic system. So this is kind of a trade-off. Before continuing, I would like to mention something regarding the, the level of abstractions when we are modeling a nervous system. When I explain this, I like to use this picture taken from the classical textbook, The Computational Brain by Churchland and Sainovsky, in which you can see that when we describe the nervous system, we can work at all these seven uh, different levels, starting from the synapse or even uh, synapse, sorry, and even lower uh, level like molecules or in the, we can model individual neurons, networks, etc. So we can start, we can have a model of the synapse, uh, how two per neurons are uh, communicating, or we can have a, a model of the neurons, uh, sorry, of, the, of a network. This is a classical picture from uh, the early studies in the 60s of uh, how long we saw about the, the visual cortex of the cat. So we have the receptive fields of uh, some ganglion neurons combined to, 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 to give rise to a receptive field uh, about a, a rod oriented in a particular direction. So it has your model in a network, right? And at the high level, you can model uh, a subsystem of the brain. In this case, this is the, a model of the visual system, of part of the visual system of the monkey. Okay, so we are going to work at this level, at the level of a system. So let's move to the, our proposal. Based on all these findings and more or less what I explained before, our proposal of a computational model is to describe at this level like kind of a block with specific functions and with a specific connection and with a clear data flow between the two. So as I mentioned before, so we have this early visual processing, basic visual features, edges, etc. Then we have some still at the occipital cortex, we will have the equivalent to these regions, V3A and V3, which some still early processing but at a slightly higher level is conducted. And then we separate in what is the, the ventral stream with V4, that is dealing with invariance representation, with CIP, with the description of graspable features, more local description. Then we'll have object recognition on the LOC, and <clears throat> AIP at the dorsal stream for this uh, synth grasp synthesis. And then we have to include some other, other regions that I didn't speak about, like LIP, which is related to object distance, or the somatosensory related uh, areas. We would include the, the, so the motor areas like this uh, premotor, or even basal ganglia should be considered. M1 for the actual execution of the, of the task, prefrontal courses to have some influence about the, the goals, even the cerebellum. Should be. So this gives us a kind of a full picture, but I, I, I would like to stress that, of course, we're not going to model the cerebellum, but 
uh, at least it should be included there and it can play a role. And we need to, uh, in the book, you can see a description of the, the functions and the connection between all these uh, areas. Of course, I'm going to describe this. I'm running out of time. So I'm going to focus on a particular subsystem here, which is this kind of uh, part of the, of the uh, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, you see there's lots of connection, which is our contribution uh, between the, the two V4 and CIP, you see here. All these connections are uh, referred to the information of data between the two streams, which is the novelty. So, as I was saying, uh, and we focus here, and in particular, just to give you a, a feeling out of um, how we should continue working with this model, we need to, of course, to make design choices based on trade-off. Uh, either we want it to, to be uh, purely based on uh, biology, or we want it to, in the end, uh, work as a robotic system. So it, there's a question always here in this kind of models. It is, what is the level of biological real, realism that is required? So we cannot contradict neuroscience findings, but when we go below, uh, we cannot go below and model uh, the neuron or the, or the synapse. Uh, we need to, at some point, to make a trade-off and try to implement things that are mm, consistent with the findings, even though, even though we need to keep at a certain level. Okay. So let me just give you an example to show that you have a film on how it works. So let's work on CIP. I didn't speak very much about CIP, but you will understand. In uh, experiments conducted by Sakata and others, they mm, discovered that there are kind of two kinds of neurons uh, in this region, in this caudal intraparietal sulcus, or CIP, in macaques. So here you see that uh, we have what is called an SOS, that stands for Surface Orientation Selecting Neuron. And you see the response of the neuron when this, the subject, the monkey, is uh, observing either this kind of square plate with different orientations or these cylinders. You see that the response, the preferred resp view is this one very little response with this particular neuron with the cylinder and very and if you change the orientation is the difference. Yes? Hello? Okay, I can I can hear a lot of noise. No, I don't know if this is Yeah, I open it. Can you hear me? To, uh, ah, yes. sorry. Angel, no, I was just uh, asking you to, but you have a few minutes still. Yeah, yeah, just I'm aware, I'm aware. And, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Let me now just show I, this example. Now and, uh, I close my microphone. Just, okay. okay, no problem. Yeah, I'm checking the time. I'm aware that um, it's about time. So let me just give you a, a feeling of this example. So then you have this, uh, this particular kind of uh, response based on uh, this particular kind of neuron. This is the, so that, mm, the mm, usually the techniques that are used and the information you get. So what do we do? <clears throat> we need to model, in particular, the transfer fractions that would give rise to this comparative behavior. So if we have these two kinds of objects and we use these three parameters, these are the results from the literature for a particular SOS neuron. So what we do is we implement transfer function in the case based on what we call inhibition terms, these three inhibition terms, and you can read the details, and this transfer function. And by adjusting the parameters, we, in simulations, we get a very similar uh, response as the one observed in the literature. And I think this is the, the way to proceed. So. Uh, if we want biological plausibility, we need to get uh, results that are comparable to the ones obtained by uh, recording, in this case, from the, from the neurons, and so it works. This is the simulation, but it didn't, if we implement that and work with actual sim, uh, images and with robots, we obtain similar results, and this will be the activation, so we get some three clusters of neurons uh, that correspond to the two kinds of uh, neurons here and others some in between, which is similar to what is distributed in this uh, kind of uh, arc. This is consistent with the uh, findings. So let me conclude. What is 
now, of course, we are not implementing all the blocks, all the building blocks and in, the, in the model with uh, the same level of detail. But in the end, we got a, <coughs> a working system by combining all this. Uh, I'm going to skip, sorry, this this because uh, I don't have time. So we have these different ingredients for the grasp that compose the based on the model and referring to the different areas. Then we have the recipe, in this case, by uh, referring to this kind of neuron. So we will have uh, dominance of, uh, in case of plates or in case of uh, more uh, elongated objects that would uh, contribute to the actual pre-shaping or selection of the, of the configuration by the region AIP data. So we have this robotic setups and then the actual uh, Execution is based on this. Well, of course, we need to add quite a lot of uh, additional uh, results that I don't have to comment. Even I'm not showing the video, the traditional video proof, so I'm referring you to our uh, website. Incidentally, I don't believe, uh, as, uh, as Fabio knows, uh, as a good performance measure, the videos are not very good. And in fact, you won't see a neuroscientist showing a video to prove anything. So the, all the results are based on their control experiments and results and, and data and reproducible data. So if you want to watch a video, you can go there. And uh, well, I would like with the conclusions. <clears throat> We have presented this interdisciplinary approach, and we try to bridge this gap in neuroscience and robotics at the computational level, referring to grasp, grasp execution, grasp planning and execution. We try to model this at the functional level with the correct function, with the correct data flow, as refers to the findings in neuroscience. And we have a system that more or less work based on this. And uh, well, I will conclude here with uh, some uh, publicity and thank you for your attention. <clears throat> That's it. So thank you for your uh, very interesting and stimulating talk and for your advertising. Actually, we have uh, this book here, here in a shelf here, so. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. And uh, so maybe we have time for really a very quick question, and then we leave for the round table. Okay, we have one question from Plymouth. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you about, I know you talk, said that you would uh, talk mainly about the brain. Um, but when, when you're trying to do can apply synthetic methodology to something uh, like grasping. I want to ask you, how important do you feel that the also um, kind of emulating the softness or the variable stiffness of the biological arm for grasping? How important is that uh, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. In, indeed, it can be as important as the processing in the brain. So, but uh, we had to focus on something, but uh, yeah, I would, I would say that uh, in our system, this is lacking. This is kind of an old system, so we, we actually need to incorporate more modern uh, hardware to deal with, uh, with that part. Even uh, the compliance or even the nature of our fingertips themselves. Uh, the, the, our fingertips are soft, so it, by changing the, the configuration of the fingertips, you can uh, dramatically change the performance of the system and of course uh, the nature of the, the control, the, the compliance, etc. the soft uh, arms are fundamental. So, but uh, uh, in terms of the brain, this is more difficult to incorporate. So how do you incorporate? Uh, it's more at the control level. Here is uh, more at the, at the planning and, and then for the execution, the, of course, it's very uh, delicate and uh, it's not uh, as much uh, uh, focus in our in our in our work. In uh, well, I would like to mention if when when we use the neuroscience, uh, there is a, a fact that is kind of uh, mm, very general, which is that there is lots of of back projection. So it means that when I present this uh, early visual processing, so the, this very early version processing is getting back projections from from uh, Areas higher in the in the in the visual processing, so you always have this kind of uh, back projections. So when you are executing this, you're getting constantly uh, back projections or information from all kind of 
areas uh, related to the perception, for instance. So, so everything that needs to fit together, and every I think every piece is is, is important. And what you suggest, of course, is uh, is not more important. At least as important as the as the processing. But in our in this in this work, we are more dealing with uh, results in in. in uh, uh, neuro, the neurophysiology of the brain, rather than uh, other studies that relate most to the to the actual uh, uh, fingers or arm uh, control, etc. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.